Let it on. Get started just very quickly. If you're not a panelist, I know this seems incredibly rude. It's like inviting someone to your house for dinner and then saying, guess what? We haven't set a place for you. But if you can go on uh, down, um, stop your um, audio, correct? No, you, you mute yourself and then go off your screen. That way we can just have the panelists on the screen, which would be great. Um, not that we don't want to see your faces. Um, we just, we, we've been trying to figure this out, how to do this, and we thought that might be best, so thanks. Um, all right. Well, um, in, the, in the sake of brevity, we're really gonna try and get this in um, in an hour if we can, and of course, I'm pretty long-winded, so I've written mine out. Normally, I don't do that, but because of time, I don't wanna get off track. So, um, start by saying hi, everyone. Um, and my name is Mark Lorenzoni. On behalf of Dr. Wilder, and the UVA Runners Clinic, the Schultz Track Club, and the entire Lawrence Oni family. I welcome you to the first edition of Lessons Learned. Um, we're thrilled to have you, truly. Um, my lesson that I've learned as a coach is that the sport of marathoning is very much about relationships. Not just the relationships of you learning about your physical abilities, but more importantly about the personal relationships created over the many miles of training. When I started my coaching career back in 1980, my first athlete, so Cynthia, sitting right beside me, and her main goal was to, I wanted to help her get um, the very fastest she could possibly be. That was the, was the goal. And, and that was pretty much the goal I have for my, most of my athletes back in that time, those early years. But now over 40 years and 10,000 athletes later, I find that my biggest takeaway is watching countless uh, deep personal relationships born out of the simple act of putting one foot in front of the other. I've coached all those years as a volunteer, but I feel like I'm the richest man alive thanks to um, being witness to the joys of um, those countless um, friendships between my athletes. And for me, one of the lifelong relationships started back in 1986 when a, a competent young med student um, came into the shop one day and asked a simple question, will you coach me to a fast marathon? That young med student was Bob Wilder, and that day kicked off what has become one of the best friendships in my life. So this past fall, Bob and I were talking and we said, how can we connect people in this pandemic? And we're so used to being around big crowds and feeling that energy, and we thought, how could we do that? And we started thinking about these relationships and our backgrounds and said, why don't we do something called Lessons Learned, where each do a series of it, starting with this one is marathoning, but people share um, their experiences in a brief moment um, and people learn from it, experienced people. So if this goes well and it's well received, we wanna do this with high school cross country, we wanna do it with road racing, um, coaching, all kinds of things. We've got uh, lots of ideas, but we'll see how it goes today. Um, so our goal today is to have the seminar serve as a fun and informative a guide for both novice and experienced marathoners. The hardest part was narrowing down our guest um, panelist list to 15, which is the most we felt like we could squeeze in an hour. Uh, there are many wonderful, um, so many wonderful athletes I've had the fortune of coaching, so it was a real challenge to get to that 15. I tried to have the band panel be a good cross section of age, so we have age 37 to all the way up to 70 of times that people run the marathon. We have a 218 marathon or all the way up to 420 and accomplishments. Um, we have a gold medalist on with us today. We have Olympic trial runners. We have Boston marathoners. And we even have a, a one person trying to break 10 minute pace in the marathon. So we feel like we've covered it. One of the demographics I originally set out to have to um, on the panel uh, when I started this thought process um, was uh, African-American. So I started to think, and I slowly but surely got to realize that I've coached lots of African-Americans, but I have not, I'm, I'm in half marathon, 5K, 10K, but I couldn't, and maybe I'm forgetting someone, um, my apologies to that person, but it, it obviously isn't very many. So I realized I hadn't coached an African-American African -American in all my career. And so I think this is something because despite the great numbers of Ethiopians and Kenyans um, running in the big marathons, we have so few African-Americans really at any of our marathons around the country. Um, 
but things are changing. And I'm going to do a little plug here because Tuesday night we're having a town hall. Coach Vin Lanana is hosting it. It's the first one of hopefully a monthly series. And in the community section, I get to do the interview and, and we are hosting a group of young African American men who have taken our sport um, to the streets and into the, the heart of our city um, with it. It's called prolific running. There was a New York Times article about these guys. Um, this excites the heck out of me because um, some of them are training for a marathon. And I think this is the start, certainly in our community, of good changes to come. So it'd be kind of cool to, a year from now to say, I coached lots of African-American marathoners. Um, it'd be fun to really change this sport. So anyway, I invite, invite you to join that seminar on Tuesday night. It's called Track Talks. Vin used to do this at the University of Oregon. It was um, called Track Town Tuesdays. We're calling it Trackville um, Talks outside the Oval, and they're going to be alumni there. There's going to be the NCAA team that's at NCAAs this week. They're going to be interviewing some of them. And then um, the, this uh, prolific uh, running group. So I'm looking forward to that. So despite the unique uh, individuality of each of our wonderful panelists, they have things in common. They're fibers that run through the entire group. Each of them are very modest. They're very kind. And each of them deeply appreciates the gift of running. Um, they truly are great mentors. Uh, for the sport of marathon and i'm very grateful to have them with us today truly so some quick uh, housekeeping things you guys have already done the first thing you've put yourself on mute um, and and taken the screen off uh, i want to personally thank leah connor um, for all her help with all of this and all the things she does for our running community she's a true gift uh, to us in the running community if you have questions um you can email them to leah although you can have it in the chat too and then i'll try to answer as many as possible I'll put another plug in. We do every summer, we do a summer training program. Many of the folks here have participated in it um, through the Schultzville Track Club. Um, you can get information on that at the website. We started in June and it's a, you train for any marathon you want in the fall. And it's a great opportunity to learn a lot about the sport. Um, if, you're, if you wanna see the bios of the athletes today, um, refer to the website or to the chat. Uh, Leah's got them posted there. We're gonna go in alphabetical order with the last name. So, um, we'll finish with Dr. Wilder. Each person is going to be um, a lot less than I'm gabbing here, two to three minutes. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, oh, and to keep me from yapping too much, I'm going to just identify one lesson I've learned from them in one or two words from each athlete as I, as I bring them on. Oh, and by the way, I'm going on about all the people I've coached, but there's one person I have not coached um, on this panel today. Um, but she's been a dear friend to Cynthia and I for three decades, and that's Joan Benoit Samuelson. Um, she's pretty much, as far as I'm concerned, um, our most revered um, athlete in our sport. And it's such, a, such an honor to have her. Um, and so if you'll indulge me a second, um, Joan isn't going to talk early on, but I just, I'll say this now so I don't um, do it later on in the, and interrupt the flow. Um, but Joan embodies, I just chatted some thoughts down today about, to me, everything that's good about this sport that I love so much. She's humble and modest and she always, always turns the conversation away from herself when she's being praised and steers the spotlight onto the person who's talking to her, um, particularly at marathons with athletes that she's chatting with. She has class as all of her fellow competitors respect their integrity and grace just as much as her athletic accomplishments, which are numerous. She's appreciative and she's never taken for granted the sport, her accomplishments and all the countless um, things she's achieved and all the fans that she, um, she's gained over the years, never has taken that for granted. She has great balance, as I always have felt like from the moment, way back before she was married, where she chose to train was close to her family in Freeport. I always admired that. And to this day, her family takes a step above on the, on the pedestal of her, run, above her running. And she's tenaciously determined, uh, having taken her talents and abilities uh, through hard work and mental toughness to the highest level, uh, having won the Boston Marathon, set an American record in the marathon. She won the Women's Olympic Trials, you guys, in 1984. It was the inauguration of the Women's Olympic Trials. They never allowed women's before 1984. Heavens to Betsy, a woman running in a marathon. Could you imagine? So in 1984, they allowed. And she, 17 days after having arthroscopic knee surgery, she won the race. And then a few months later, won the Olympic gold. Um, for me, as an aging historian and buff of the sport, one of my favorite things about Joan is um, 
how, how she's qualified seven times she qualified for the Olympic trials starting in 84. And that streak went all the way through um, 2008. At age 250, she ran 249, age 56, she ran 250, if you can imagine. So just the mention of her name, no matter the generation, and there's a, um, always an immediate feeling of pride and gratitude to Joan. And we're grateful today for having you here, Joan. So we'll talk to you in a bit. All right, so I'm gonna get started. Shut up, Mark. Um, Joan Bienvenu, we're gonna start with you. And Joan, the lesson you've taught me is how work ethic equals success because you put that, you put so much work in your training and it pays off. So take it away, Joan. Thank you. Well, um, I'm honored to be the other Joan B on the call today. Um, and so, and I was honored um, that Mark asked me to, to take part in this. So um, my lesson today, having run a lot of marathons um, is that not all of them go according to plan. And so accepting what the day will give you and making relentless forward progress, which is something I really took from my ultra running friends Moving, moving forward will get you to the finish line, whether that's running, whether that's walking, some days it feels like you're crawling, but if you just keep pushing, you'll get there eventually. And sometimes, no matter how much you train, no matter how much preparation you have, sometimes the day just isn't your day. It's either the weather or your stomach, or sometimes it's just, just not a good day. And so being able to make adjustments during the race, take stock in where you're at, regroup and then keep making that progress i found is um is really the best way it keeps it from falling apart and it keeps you um from you know really taking that huge hit on your time so maybe it's run for a minute walk for a minute whatever you can take uh once you're out on the course really making those adjustments is huge and i've, I've learned to do that over time i used to uh bob wilder's probably the one on this call who knows best that uh i can be a little stubborn when it comes to continuing to train and continuing to push as hard as i can and um I've learned after all these marathons that sometimes you really do have to readjust uh, your, your, your goals and your hopes when you're out there on the course and not lose faith. So relentless forward progress was my first thing. And then the second one, and um, Mark, you already talked on it, but it's, it's really running with gratitude. And so the older I get, the more this lesson becomes more important to me. Um, it's gonna choke me up even just talking about it because I see so many friends and so many names on this, on this phone call right now that that I am grateful to run with every day and to consider part of my, my bigger circle of running friends. But this sport's a gift and it's something we get to do, not something we have to do. And so when you can keep that in mind, some days it does, definitely feels like something you have to do, but most days we get to run in a beautiful spot with great friends and that's really, really what it's all about. So running with gratitude is my second corollary to that. And with that, I'm gonna give back like 50 seconds worth of time, so thank you. Yeah, you got to eat away at all the time that I ate, uh, chewed up at the beginning. Thank you, Joan. Um, Leah Connor's next, and I think uh, something I learned from you is just the determination in the, in the face of pain. Um, so, so often you've had injuries, and it's just amazing um, how you keep going. Thank you. Yeah, and by the way, 7-Eleven was my slowest marathon <laughs> in an air cast with a broken sesamoid. <laughs> um, okay. So um, my name is Leah Connor, and I wanted to talk about the importance of giving thanks and giving back. Um, I want to encourage everyone to write a special thank you note to the person who's helped you get to the starting line, your coach, your significant other, your kids. Handwrite your gratitude to show your appreciation. Although for many long distance runners, this is a solo sport. When you tow the line, you're representing everyone who supported you in getting there. And for me, the best way to um, say thanks and give back to the running community that I love is to volunteer. And in 2014, I created a marathon for the Charlottesville Track Club, and it's been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Bringing together runners and volunteers to share this life-changing experience of finishing a marathon in an intimate setting has been one of my proudest accomplishments. Although the race is small with fewer than 30 finishers at each event, We've had so many amazing stories from Boston qualifiers to first time marathoners, finish times from 254 to 544. I've met so many interesting people who've been so grateful for the opportunity. Um, when you volunteer and you give and you get either the, com the camaraderie with the other volunteers, you can learn stuff. A lot of times people volunteering at races are injured or planning for their next race. So you can talk to them and get tips. Um, you get usually get some great swag from the race directors. I know that volunteering at the Boston Marathon, you can get a jacket. And then it's just the inspiration of being a supportive part of someone else's running journey. 
that is really important to me. So I highly recommend also cheering at a race. And there's no bigger crowd pleaser than an inflatable T-Rex costume I found. <laughs> Um, I was at the 5K before the Chicago Marathon as an inflatable T-Rex and I have never had more people like smile and stop for a photograph in my life. It was awesome. Um, and I just wanted to finish off by um, thanking both Co Coach Mark and my identical twin sister, Melinda, who have been with me every step of the way from my first marathon in 2007 through Sun next Sunday, which will be my 34th and could be my second slowest. <laughs> So thank you. Wow. That's great, Leah, thanks. Um, next was uh, Jenny Goswami. And I think what you taught me is just perspective and balance. Um, Cause I've been coaching you since you were single and you now have three married and three kids and uh, you're still doing it and you still keep that balance. Well, thanks Mark. Um, I was gonna talk a little bit today about the importance of your mind in marathon racing. Um, specifically keeping focused on one mile at a time. And as many of you know, as Mark athlete, Mark's athletes, um, this is something Mark talks about a lot, not thinking one mile down, 25 to go, or 10 miles down, 16 to go, but keeping focused on just each mile and chunking it so it's not so daunting. Um, and this resonates with me a lot. And last year, I guess 2019, I ran the Twin Cities Marathon. And my goal was to qualify for the Olympic trials. So I needed to run average of like 617 per mile to get it. And I remember so specifically three miles in, I was going up a pretty big hill and my breathing was labored and I just felt tired three miles in. And all these thoughts came in. I looked down at my watch, it said like 645 and everything came to me of, oh my gosh, I have 23 miles. What was I thinking? How could I ever have done this? And as me, immediately I kind of acknowledged those thoughts and said, no, I'm gonna get rid of those thoughts and take Mark's advice and finish this mile and restart at mile four. And I took the entire rest of the race one mile at a time, focusing on, do I need to drink? Do I need to eat? Stay relaxed. Even at mile 23, there wasn't the thought of 23 down, three to go. At that point, it was little chunks, get to the next light post, get to the next kind of these little mini goals and you get there and you feel proud of yourself for getting there and you move on to the next one. Um, and I finished, I averaged 613, I qualified for the trials and I was really proud of it, not just for the time and doing it, but also I feel like it was a big turning point mentally that I could really use my mind um, to help me, that I could connect with it instead of it bringing me down. I think your mind in a marathon can do a lot of worrying. You can worry, what am I gonna feel like at mile 22? What if my legs feel bad? What about those splits behind me? They were too slow. And instead of worrying, worrying really gets you nowhere. But staying in the present um, and focusing on what you can do in those little chunks can really help you get going. Um, so you can practice it in long runs, in your workouts, not worrying about what your fifth mile repeat is going to feel like, but just staying in the one you're in um, and finishing that. And then you get these little mini feedbacks of you accomplished little mini goals. So that was one tip I, um, from Mark that I used that's really resonated and helped me become a better athlete. So thanks. Great, Jenny. Yeah, yeah fantastic. That's a great, great bit of advice there. Okay, so Mark Hampton is next. And I, I, the lesson I learned from you, Mark, is um, thinking things out. And I'm famous for speaking before I think. And, you know, I'm, it's, you're so cerebral about stuff and connecting dots. And it's been a good teacher to me. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm going to talk about the importance of cross training and in particular strength and conditioning training. Um, my experience was uh, like a lot of runners. Um, um, by the time I was about to turn 50, I'd run more than 20 marathons and ultra marathons uh, four times at Boston, but I would really hit a plateau and was having a real hard time sort of breaking through to that next level. And in fact, it was really backsliding. Um, and actually was accompanying that were a, a series of minor injuries, but injuries that reminded me that I was being really hard on my body. So um, the spring before I turned 50, I decided that I was gonna take cross training uh, much more deliberately. And um, I engaged the services. I was working at a small college in Maryland, Washington College, um, and knew the, 
um, athletic staff and was able to engage the services of one of the strength and conditioning coaches. And um, it made a huge difference. Um, I first noticed it when I was running a trail race and um, tripped a little bit. And it was a spill that a year earlier, I would have fallen all over the trail. And I was able just because of the greater strength and balance to recover from a number of those. And it was just really great to feel that um, improvement in my running. But what really um, excited me is um, right after I turned 50, um, I uh, ran the St. George Marathon and um, PR'd by almost four full minutes and in fact ran 21 minutes faster than my spring marathon. So um, it was the first time that I'd gotten sub 320 and I felt really good and followed that up in the spring with um, a run at the Phoenix Marathon where I again PR'd. Um, this time it was sub 315. Um, and I just remember the feeling of mile 18 to 25, where normally I would just feel like the wheels were falling off. And I just felt solid, you know, that my run was, you know, in good form and that I wasn't pounding my body in those late miles. And so it's just something that, um, you know, I've actually fallen off the wagon a little bit right now and need to get back to it. But I'm just reminded that as runners, you know, we put in a lot of miles, but we've got to put in a lot of other work to, to respect the other parts of our body that aren't getting the exercise um, um, that comes with running. And so um, I'd say, you know, if you've hit a plateau or if you're finding yourself, self, um, you know, getting those injuries, really spend some time on those core exercises, um, on balance, things that, you know, offset um, the sort of hazards of running. Um, it's going to make you a stronger, much more solid and much more consistent. It's great, Mark. And, you know, what we're all doing right here currently is our number one enemy, which is sitting. And as we age, we sit more and more, so the core gets weaker and weaker. So great tips. Um, Charlie Hurt, um, you, I, I like to think I find joy in running and coaching, but Charlie, you've taught me to find it in the worst days um, because of your attitude. And uh, I, you're the guy who finds the sunshine in the rain. And that sounds corny, but anybody knows you, um, knows it's true. So thanks for that. No problem. Like I said, I'm Charlie. Um, I've run about 10 marathons and um, my thought is make a plan. Uh, the marathon is a law, big physical feat and it takes a lot of mental energy yeah. to do. And the best way to tackle it successfully is to make a plan, map out how you're gonna get from point A to point B. So find your marathon, figure out your goal, and work backwards to figure out when to start. And that way you can plan it all out, you can slowly build your long runs, slowly build your mileage, and slowly build upon the workouts you did before. So hopefully every week you're adding one more mile to your marathon pace workouts, adding some hills, adding some track stuff. So if you have a coach, awesome. Ask him, ask them what your plan is so you can see all the progression to your going. And that way you're not planning your heaviest training week the week you go to the beach with your in-laws. So you can figure it out and plan for it. Um, a second thing is know the course. So many people don't look at the course and I don't understand why. I'm not the most talented guy out there, but I look at the course and I find the advantages and I capitalize on this stuff. So they give you the answers to the test. Look at the course map, figure out where the hills are, figure out where the mile marks are, figure out where the, the turns are, the landmarks, the aid stations, know it all. So you can plan for it. You can have it in your mind. So when you're out there, you can rock and roll. Um, all these courses are different and you can take the aspect of their terrain and apply it to your training. CIM is really hilly than flat. Boston's downhill, uphill. Um, Indy, flat. So like if you're going to do a hilly marathon, don't work out on the flat river trail. Go to Bel Air and you know, run a bunch of hills. Um, another aspect is figure out what fuel they're providing. If they're providing orange Powerade, guess what you're gonna be drinking during training? Orange Powerade. Drink it during your, your long runs, drink it through your workouts, drink it all the time. Get your body used to that stuff. 
Um, if the goos know what goos are doing, if they're going cliff shots, practice a couple of cliff shots. Let's say you don't like cliff shots. Well, that's fine. But what if you lose your goo? What if you drop it? What if you're dying and you're out of goo? You want to be able to handle that fuel, you know, when you're racing. So you got to get used to it. Um, yeah, so know the course. And my third thing was uh, race day itinerary. Racing is very chaotic. Race weekends are very chaotic. And all I want to do is relax and focus on running hard, running fast. So I don't want to deal with all the stress and anxiety and all this stuff. So I make this big itinerary. When am I traveling? What, how am I traveling? Where's my hotel? When am I getting to the hotel? When am I eating? When am I running? Where's packet pickup? When's packet pickup? When should I go to bed? When am I getting up? Three hours before your race. Um, where's the corral? How long is it going to take me to get to the corral? That way it's all planned out. You don't have to worry about this stuff. You can just, you got all the thing in front of you and you can plan out what you want to do and just take care of it. So you can focus on the biggest thing, running hard when it counts. So make a plan, make a plan. Had a boy, Charlie. And you made a plan at the trials. I said, because of your time, you're not going to be up with the leaders. Be back in the back. And what were you second to last at the mile mark? And yes. finished Very 76 good. out of 220 people. Pretty impressive. That was making a plan and following it. Thanks, Charlie. Our next one is um, Bob Johnson. And Bob, what you've taught me is, and everyone is going to agree with this today that I have not done a good job, is brevity and conciseness. No nonsense. That is Bob Johnson. Just get to the point, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Um, I, I wondered what Mark's message was going to be to have me on this panel. I mean, it, it's almost like one of those exam questions. You know, Joan Benoit's on this panel, Jenny, Charlie Hurt, folks that are really accomplished, and then Bob Johnson. It's like, which one of these doesn't belong? But I think that I have a message that can uh, resonate with a lot of folks, and I think I'm probably the extreme. I think I probably have the worst ratio of marathons actually run to marathons signed up for on this panel. Okay, I've signed up for a lot of marathons, and I haven't been able to make the starting line. And I think I've figured out some of the reasons why I, I i i i believe and i'm it's funny i'm looking at bob wilder bob just saw me yesterday i broke down in the haven 8k was supposed to run the green belt marathon leah's marathon coming up uh next sunday and i'm not going to be able to run it because i've pulled a hamstring um but i actually think it's a success story and let me tell you why um, I've been able to actually successfully complete uh, two marathons, one in September and one in November. And I see Harry Landers there, both run almost step for step with Harry. And I think the reason why is, is, is kind of fourfold. It's trying to get to the starting line in decent shape and uninjured. And what's the secret there? Well, one of the things that I, that I sent out that's on, this, uh, that's on the website is the far side cartoon. I love the far side. And it's a, a picture of, the, the, uh, of Vikings. And it says the Vikings, of course, knew the importance of stretching before an attack. And really, Mark, that should be the Vikings knew the importance of stretching after an attack. Um, because you, you really don't want to stretch muscles that, are, that, that aren't warmed up. But what I've gone to doing is um, to try and remain uninjured. I warm up before I run, and then I stretch after I run pretty religiously. The second thing is um, I've been able, since I've retired, I've been able to establish a routine. Um, when I was working, I was flying roughly 250,000 air miles a year, and that isn't very conducive to having any kind of routine, and, and all that sitting hurt too. But uh, having a routine, having folks to work out with in the morning, having the ability to, 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 to be regular in something and establish a routine, I think has helped a lot. The biggest light bulb that went off for, for me, or that went on for me is um, running slow to run fast. You know, I've been following Mark's training program 
And I believe, Mark, that it's approximately 80% of the miles are aerobic heart rate miles and 20% are at pace. I never did that when I was on my own. I thought, how in the world could you possibly run fast if you trained slower? And, uh, you know, the ability, I ran a Boston qualifier in November, and I did that 80% of my miles were slow miles, and I thought that was great. And the fourth thing is something that Mark Hampton uh, uh, addressed is cross-training. Um, as you get older, I think, I don't think my body's able to take the pounding that it was able to take perhaps when I was in my 20s. So I do a lot of cross training. I do a lot of cycling. And, you know, some may look at the fact that I'm not able to run this marathon coming up on Sunday, that, that, that uh, perhaps I need to readjust things. But being able to run two in a matter of three months, uh, you know, I think for me was incredibly successful. So I appreciate the the opportunity to to uh, be on the panel. That's great, Bob. Yeah, good, very good thoughts there. And speaking of Harry Landers, he's next. Um, and you've taught me, Harry, something that I do believe in. It's, it's on the Charlie Bain, but you just got a wonderful sense of humor. And you're, you always, I always feel like you're in the mode of, if we're going to be spending two hours out here running, let's have a good time. Let's make it fun. And um, Harry is our captain of our Boston Bound group has been for several years after Heidi um, was in a he's a perfect perfect leader for the group take it away Harry Harry you're on mute mute not anymore <laughs> <laughs> I I was a late starter to running and marathoning I didn't I didn't start this sport until I was 50 and when I started, I didn't know anybody else that ran. I didn't know anything about coaching or training groups or anything else like that. And so that meant that I did everything the same. All my runs were the same pace. I didn't do speed work. I just, I just ran. And I ran my first marathon and I, my time was 419. And I decided I liked it. And I became a very consistent 419 marathoner because I did the same thing. And I'm thinking back to my fourth marathon. I did that in Hyannis on, uh, on Cape, Co Cape Cod. And it was in February and it was really cold. Temperatures in the single digits. There was snow piled up two feet on the sides of the roads. And there were about 300 people in that marathon and there was also a half marathon. So it was a double loop course. Probably 75% of the people ran the half marathon. By the time I got to the second loop, there was nobody around. It was cold and I'm freezing wind is coming in off the, off the ocean. And it was pretty clear I was gonna run another 419 marathon. And I was just feeling miserable and not understanding the point of it. And just, this is terrible. Why, why do I wanna even keep doing this? And I got to about mile 23 and there was a volunteer who was there by the side of the road. And as I passed him, he pointed up ahead and way up in the distance, there was a guy, you could just barely see him. He was dressed in a chicken costume, feathers and a hat and the whole, just a chicken. And as I passed, the guy said to me, you can take the chicken. And all of a sudden, out of this stupid thing, I had like a new point to run in this race. There were only three miles left, but as God is my witness, I'm going to take the chicken. And so that was my, the goal of my race was to spend the next three miles trying to catch up, catch up to the chicken. And I did. And so, I don't know, maybe instead of running a 419 marathon, I ran a 418. The point of the story that I'm telling you this is when we run marathons, we invest about a good four months of our lives into training for it. And if we go into it with a goal and with a single goal, the whole, there can be a whole bunch of reasons why we don't make that goal. 
and it can lead to a lot of disappointment when you don't. Um, and you feel like it's time wasted and why am I doing this? Um, and so my lesson is to go into a marathon, sure, with a goal, you know, I want to, I want to PR, I want to qualify for Boston, or I want to run sub four minutes, or I want to at four hours or under three hours, or I want to beat this person. That's great. That's your A goal. But I've learned, have a B goal. When the wheels start falling off, what else can I do here? You know, uh, if it's not to PR, it's, well, maybe I can run the fastest marathon I have in the past five years. Um, or um, uh, maybe I can, I can finish without throwing up. Uh, wh whatever it is, have a B goal, have a C goal. Um, I think this is something that gives a lot more meaning to an individual marathon experience and it sure keeps me motivated uh, in, in whatever I'm doing running. So that's my lesson is go into a race with, with multiple goals and have something to fall back on. And uh, if it means all you're gonna do is take the chicken, take the chicken. <laughs> Harry, that was wonderful. <laughs> I know I, I knew you were going to talk about ABC, but I didn't think the chicken story was going to come. That's great. Um, next one is a uh, person sitting to my, my right is Cynthia. And I, I mean, I, I'm still learning lessons from Cynthia every day, um, 40 years of marriage. But Cynthia, I think, uh, you know, you were my first marathoner. I don't know if I've ever coached anyone more mentally tough. Um, your feet were bleeding and you kept on running. You won that first Marine Corps. And I just, um, I never seen anything like it before. So um, taught me to kind of stop complaining about the small things. About goal wait, visualization? Wait. Oh, no. I had you on mute. Oh, I'm gonna talk about visualizing your goals. And um, it's something I learned in high school and I was really lucky I had a great coach, but I started running as a freshman in high school. I went up for the track team with my friends and I always knew that I was going to be better the longer the race. And in 1973, that was a mile. So I became a miler. And every week I raced a mile because we raced a lot back then. And, um, and I started to get faster. So fast forward to my sophomore year in the spring, I got down to 522. And, my, and I was really happy with that because I never was an athlete. And so this is also new to me. But my high school coach goes, I think you can break five minutes before you graduate and I'm like okay I don't get the connection I don't know what you're talking about you're crazy like that's so fast I don't think I can do that but um but what he really when I stepped back and thought about it I realized that as I went along through high school that I could start to visualize running that fast e even though it seemed like impossible that I could actually do it but um he planted a seed that day and I carried it with me as I trained for the next two years. And so, um, and I began to really visualize that. I, I spent a lot of time training and, and when I was racing, thinking about running a five minute mile. So fast forward 10 years, I ran in college and then I started running marathons um, in my early 20s. So it was like 1981, I ran Marine Corps and I ran 250 in my first marathon. I was just trying to find out what it was all about. And Mark, who was coaching me at the time, um, afterwards we talked about it and he goes, I think you can break 240. And I said, I think I can too. And, and it became this thing I was fixated on. I was visualizing running six minute pace for 26 miles. And so many of my friends think, were like, that is so fast. I don't know how you get from 250 to 240, but I just went right back to what my high school coach taught me. Like, if you can't visualize it, it's not going to happen. And so it took me five marathons, um, but in a couple years, but I worked really hard and I went down to Houston in 1983 and I, run, I ran a 238 marathon. It was like a six minute PR that day. So I just felt like, had I not been able to think about what that was going to feel like and how I was going to train for that and how it was going to execute the race, um, it probably wouldn't have happened. But on that day, I enjoyed every single mile and I had a blast. It was so much fun. So I was, I just felt so lucky that it all worked out for me. So I, I think that whatever your goal is, you really need to start visualizing it and imagining what it's going to feel like and how you're going to make it happen. Um, 
and and is if you have a clear visual when you're training you can really just stay focused on the goal and your training should be very specific to that goal that you have um and it'll also help you not overtrain. Um, I have made that mistake before, running with people that are too fast with, that, faster than me. Um, and it'll keep you from leaving your race out on the roads in your training. So um, as we all know, the journey is so long, 26.2 um, miles. And um, it's always best to stay focused on your goal and to visualize the end result. So um, if your thoughts are filled with doubts, um, and the flip side, um, and you can't see yourself attaining the goal, if you don't have a clear vision, then you're probably not going to do it. And I guess I'll end with, most importantly, you got to have fun doing it. <laughs> That's what I always say. That you do. Um, thanks, Cynthia. That was great. Um, so next is Bill Petrie. And Bill, uh, you've taught me, um, through all of our stressors and all our frustrations, you are always thinking kind thoughts, and you're always looking for the good in others. And you bring that perspective all the time. I'll be stressing about something, or somebody's talking about a bad race or whatever. And Bill, you always find the, the good, and you are um, truly, truly a kind person. No, Mark, thanks for saying that. That's high praise coming, coming from you. And uh, I wanted to just talk about just how much I benefited from being part of uh, other runners' lives uh, through through everything that you have created in, in the community. And uh, I think I, when I was getting into this, uh, Harry uh, telling me that, that his kids couldn't believe that he had friends. And I thought, that's really true you know, for me too. You know, early in our lives, you know, we're so busy with our families and with our jobs, careers sort of thing. It's hard to make time to have friends. And I have like the most profound, wonderful friendships through running. Uh, friends who pace me on Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m. at CHS, uh, pace me at the Haven 8K, at the River Belt uh, Marathon. Uh, and the conversations that one has one-on-one -on, -one on a one-hour race or run, you know, where no one else can overhear you. It just, it's just very profound, the friendships. And Mark, thank you so much for that. And, and Joan, for your message too, like just running with gratitude. So thank you. Bill, yeah, it's, we always feel honored. You know, Bill is our, our local Dr. Fauci, so we always feel honored to have Bill <laughs> speak in, in such humble terms. Um, you know, you've, you've been a gift to us, Bill. Um, okay, so we're on to the Ryans next, and uh, we're going to start with Katie. And Katie, I think of you, the things you've taught me are humility, and, and try, it's harder for me. It comes so naturally for you, so it's modesty. Um, those two words uh, come to mind of what the lesson I've learned from you. So, uh, Katie Ryan. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my topic is the do's and don'ts of marathoning with your spouse or partner. Um, so I should start by saying that for me, marathoning with my husband, Jim, literally means we're both running, which I get is maybe not true for most couples. Um, so I'm hoping that some of these do's and don'ts might apply to situations where one person's doing the actual running and the other is at risk of kind of doing everything else. Um, so I'm sure you're all aware that deciding to run a marathon is no small thing to add to your plate or to your partner's plate and figuring out how to fit it in requires some balancing. So I've got three quick stories um, that I thought might illustrate some do's and don'ts. So to lay the groundwork, it's 2010. Uh, Jim and I have four kids. Three are playing travel soccer. We have two jobs and a variety of other things that is making life pretty full. Jim sort of sneaks his way into running a marathon. Um, first, he's just keeping our friend Bill company while he trains for Philly. He's maybe doing a little pacing for him. Then he's actually gonna run Philly with Bill because after all, once you've done all that training, you might as well. Um, and then he leaves Bill around the halfway mark in the marathon because he's feeling strong. He finishes the race, manages to qualify for Boston, and now he's set to do it all over again. So at this point, I'm running maybe two to three miles a day. I'm pushing a baby jogger with two dogs, and I'm feeling a little put out. Um, so there's not a lot of balance, you might be thinking. Um, so that brings us to story number one, and it's a short one. Jim convinces me that I too should qualify for Boston. So for the next five months, he signs up to watch the kids, walk the dogs, cheer me on. I train, I run Baltimore, I qualify for Boston, and the balance is back. Um, so the first set of do's and don'ts is um, don't think you can start running marathons and assume that nothing else in your life needs to give. Um, and the second one 
is do figure out a schedule that enables both you to have time to run and your spouse to have time to run or not to run and do something else that he loves, knowing that you've got the rest covered. So story number two plays out over a few years. Jim and I are now happily entrenched in our respective zip codes in Mark's Boston bound group and we're loving it. I keep having injuries along the way though. And Mark's first question to me is always, Katie, have you been running on your recovery days with Jim? So the answer is always yes, uh, because running on recovery days is like date morning for us. Um, but from a running perspective, it's kind of a disaster because I speed up just a bit to keep up with Jim and then boom, I'm injured. So the second set of do's and don'ts um, are do figure out how to carve out some time in your schedule to spend time with your partner, whether you're running or not, but don't speed up your recovery runs to accomplish that. Okay, the third story is from Boston 2013. Jim had his BQ for the following year already, of course, I didn't. So he offered to pace me in the race. Mark again cautioned us, but we stuck with our plan. We each had a wristband with the mile times and a Garmin. At around mile seven, I'm starting to suck wind and can't quite believe it after all the training. I look at my watch instead of my trusty pacer and see that I'm running 30 seconds too fast. I point this out to Jim who says, I'll be fine and I'll appreciate the cushion at the end. Around the halfway point, I know I'm in trouble. I look at my watch and I'm 30 seconds too slow. Jim looks at his Garmin and his wristband and he adjusts our plan. If I just run this next couple miles a little faster, I'll still hit my goal. A few miles later, seeing that speeding up's not in the cards, he adjusts again. If I just keep my pace, I'll beat my time from last year. Finally, around mile 22, he starts in again and I've absolutely had it. So I say something like, Jim, you know what the goal is now? The goal is to cross the finish line. You can stop looking at your watch and doing math in your head. You go if you're such an, in such a hurry and I'll meet you at the hotel. Fortunately, the story doesn't end there. Jim stuck with me. We crossed the finish line together. And about 15 minutes later, the bombs went off. So the last set of do's and don'ts. Um, for sure, don't adjust your race plan on race day just because your spouse or partner thinks he knows better. But more importantly, do keep your race goal in perspective and recognize that ultimately crossing the finish line with your partner means a whole lot more than crossing at the time set on your race band. Thanks. Golly, Katie. You had to write a book, you know? <laughs> I, I think that would be good. Follow up to your spouse there. That's excellent, thanks. Okay, Jim, what I've learned from you, Jim, you are thoughtful. And it, I, I just talked about the book a little bit, but just, I use your phrases so often, I try anyway, things like I wonder, instead of giving my opinion, I wonder. And the second one is, you know, how may I help? rather than giving the help without being asked. So thanks, Jim. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thanks for having me on this panel. So I'm gonna pick up where Katie left off and talk about a basic lesson that it's obviously hard for me um, to learn, and that's the importance of not going out too fast, um, in that it is way better to keep gas in your tank than to put miles in the bank. Um, so, uh, um, you would have thought I would learn this lesson um, based on an experience I had in, uh, in the Marine Corps Marathon years and years ago, before I was involved with this group, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I think I was training to run an eight minute pace. That's what I had trained for. And I started the race and just ran how I felt. Um, and I felt great. Um, and I was running seven and a half minute miles seemingly without much effort at all. And I just, I couldn't believe it. And I thought, okay, I'm just gonna keep running. And I, I had a cell phone, one of those old flip cell phones. And I called up Katie around mile 13. And I said, this is unbelievable. I mean, I'm just kind of flying along and I feel great. It wasn't like I was trying to go fast. And Katie said, I don't think you're supposed to do that. And I said, I know, but you know, I mean, I'm just running, I'm just running how I feel. Well, I felt great until about mile 16, and then the wheels started coming off the bus. And like in one mile, my legs stopped working. I went to uh, the water station and I couldn't, I could barely run. Um, so the last 10 miles were horrific. 
I got it slower and slower and slower. And I only went from seven and a half minute miles to eight and a half to nine to 10. I remember the pace group, the eight minute pace group came charging by at mile 22. A friend of mine had decided to um, pace me for the last eight miles and he could see I was hurting. So he said, don't even try to talk. I I'll, I'll do all the talking. And even that after four miles, I just couldn't summon the energy just to listen. So uh, over half a mile, I, I managed to spit out, please stop talking. Um, and it was, a, it was the worst experience I've had. I, obviously, I still had more to learn in pacing others. But the thing that I realized is you can't run how you feel in the first half of the marathon. It's a really bad idea because if you've trained well, running at marathon pace should be really simple. So in order not to go too fast, you have to consciously slow yourself down. And going back to what Jenny said about thinking of it one mile at a time, I now think about how can I hit my pace? And if it means like even after a half mile, I'm going too fast, I slow down and reward myself and think about, okay, I'm getting great gas mileage for the first half of the marathon because your gas mileage is going to get worse in the second half of the marathon. Um, and, you know, if it turns out you're running too slow, when you get to mile 16, 17, 18, you can always speed up. But I've never had that experience, but I suppose it's possible. Um, so that's, a, that's the lesson I learned. You really, really have to think hard and consciously hold yourself back. Thanks. That's great, Jim. Appreciate it. Very, very good. Yeah. Love it. Um, okay, so next um, is Joni. So uh, I, I did my introduction earlier. So what I've learned from you, Joni, is just um, grace and courage, honestly. And I'm from admiring you from afar and then getting to know you as a friend. Um, those are two things I take from you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all, um, lots of lessons to be learned and I'm learning as we go along here. Um, Charlie, maybe I will look at my next marathon course. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's taken me six decades to do so, but you know, there's still time, I hope. And um, Jim, I, you've dispelled all my beliefs. I always run the way I feel. So um, for better or for worse. And uh, that's exactly what I did in LA when I wasn't running my own race. I said, I need to run out run and uh, get out of the pack and run my own race and find my own pace. And um, it worked that day. But as many of you have already alluded to, um, you have to believe in your training. You have to have gratitude for what the sport has given to all of us. And um, you can't run anybody else's race but your own. And I always have trusted my gut. And sometimes it's failed me, but um, most of the time not. And uh, Katie, your point about finishing a marathon with Jim, um, I had a similar experience in Berlin, but it was with our daughter. And, uh, you know, I have want, had a goal of running sub six, sub three hour marathons in six decades. And that wasn't quite into my sixth decade. I ran a 302, but to cross the finish line with Abby was pretty special. And um, so thank you for all your lessons because they're um, good reminders for for what's to come for all of us. But storytelling is what keeps me motivated. The first words my mother uttered to me after I crossed the finish line in LA and was embraced my, by my parents on the other side of the track was, now can you quit? And um, I kind of looked at my mother in disbelief saying, what do you mean now can, can I quit? And, and Cynthia, as you talked about goals, I still had goals in the sport that I wanted to achieve. So. I said to my mother, mom, I'm not ready to quit. I'll quit running when you quit smoking. Well, she quit, oh, 40 years ago and lived uh, 15 days shy of 99. So um, she was an amazing woman. And um, so that really started the storytelling for me. And then I ran uh, the 2008 Olympic trials in Boston where I'd started my career. And I thought, what a place to go out. I was 50. I had a goal of breaking a sub 250 marathon at the age of 50. I achieved that goal. I was met at the finish line by the three Olympic qualifiers, uh, Dina Castor, uh, Blake Russell, and Magdalena Boulay, and sort of walked off into the sunset thinking, 
what a way to go out. And then that fall, I received a call from Mary Wittenberg in New York asking me if I'd come to New York to run the 40th anniversary of the New York City Marathon, which coincided with the 25th anniversary of my Olympic win. And I said, well, that tells a story. Sure, I'll come to New York. And the following year, it was Chicago and similar circumstances. It was the 25th anniversary of my um, fastest marathon. And the, the date of marathon was 10, 10, 10. And I couldn't pass on those numbers. But then less than three weeks later, the Athens Marathon was taking place. And that was celebrating the 25th, 100th anniversary of the Battle of Marathon. And I said, well, any marathoner who really wants to consider themselves a marathon or needs to run that event so over to athens i went and that was a big mistake i normally don't run more than two marathons a year and that was less than you know a month that i ran another one um, and then it's just continued um you know going to boston to celebrate the 30th anniversary of my olympic win and then again the 30th anniversary of uh my boston marathon which coincided um uh the with the bombings and uh that was um that was just something that rocked our sport deep down to its core and i went back the following year and ran with our two children which was something special so the storytelling continues last year i went back or to 2019 um went back to try to run within 40 minutes of my marathon 40 years earlier so that motivates me to keep going so when you talk about goals um we're all capable of telling story. We all have the innate quality of being storytellers. And whether you know it or not, your story is going to inspire somebody else. Um, and when I founded the Beach to Beacon 10K in my hometown, um, I decided it was my way of giving back to a sport and a community that had given so much to me. And it's not the elite runners that come across the finish line that really inspires me. It's the runners at the back of the pack who never thought they'd be able to achieve the goal of running a 10K and they do it and you've never seen happier faces in your life. So they're storytellers too. So find your stories and go out and tell them. Golly, Joan, that was wonderful. Um, the, the Jim, has confided me earlier with the group when we were um, off off air um, that he and Katie have to get going at four and at five. At five sorry, so, I just got us. I just bought us ten more minutes, so keep going. Did? Okay, because well, I'm going to do it now anyway because I don't want to. I'm going to put you guys in a pickle here, and uh, um, we we're going to do we we're going to do this at the end. So excuse me to to Linda and Bev and, and Bob, and we'll still get you guys on. But we Bob and I were going to do a quick little surprise and just have. Jim and Joan chat with each other, and Jim asked Joan a question. Joan asked Jim a question. Something that's a burning question. Uh, um, you know, we're all celebrities here, but just uh, having you two uh, with your busy lives to um, join us, I thought it would just be neat. And what's interesting, when Joan, you came to visit us and spent the weekend with us, which was wonderful, and came down for a wedding, and you were like, "You know, Jim Ryan? Oh my gosh!" And like, you know, I love his book, and and then. Katie's like, you know, Joan Benoit, and it just goes to show you that it's everyone's perspective. So I thought it'd be neat if you guys um, did a, a quick uh, a question back and forth. So knowing you have to go, Jim, that'll keep it really fast. But uh, um, anyway, fire away. Um, well, I appreciate it, Mark. Um, uh, and Joan, I loved what you had to say. Um, so uh, you are, uh, an incredibly celebrated and admired um, runner and athlete, uh, as, as Mark described. And there are many people um, who look up to you. Um, what I'm wondering is, who do you look up to? So which athlete in any sport, um, alive or dead, male or female, um, do you admire the most and why? Well, I told Jim in a separate email, he was really testing my my intellectual um, ability to uh, d describe that person. And I've asked that question often, and it's a really hard question for me to answer. And there are people you might think I would say, but truly um, my admiration is for the unsung heroes, the people who are on the, uh, before the 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 wave rolled in um or the tide came in with women's sports and uh, you know to this day first of all most of my role models were in skiing 
and ski racers, the Cochran family. They grew up in Vermont. The father was a coach. There were three family members, and now the grandson is ski racing downhill and doing well. And I still sp follow the sport of skiing because I'm passionate about it. But um, I think about the, the woman who preceded me before Title IX, when we really didn't have the opportunities, but they were out doing it anyway. And one in particular who I'm still very close to this day is a woman by the name of Brooke Merrow Adelman, who now lives in Montana and we're still in touch. And she won the first high school mile contested in the state of Maine. And I was just coming off a broken leg. I had suffered ski racing. And I said to my coach, I want to win that event next year. And Brooke to me is that person um, because it's a two-way road with the friendship and the ability to inspire. And um, there are just so many women out there who led the way for me to open doors even wider for others. So I know that's sort of skirting the question, Jim, but there's so many unsung heroes out there who have really impacted my life in so many positive ways. Um, but Brooke still, still stands out. Because she took a dare. I mean, you remember back then, people thought if women ran more than 1,500 meters, they'd do bodily harm and never be able to bear children. Well, two children and 150,000 miles later, I'm still there and trying to do the same for other women that Brooke did for me. And nobody will ever know Brooke's name, um, but or very few people will. But she's a, she's a wonderful woman who continues to inspire me to this day. It's a great answer. So Joan, that was wonderful, wonderful. And um, I'm wondering if you have a question for President Ryan, for Jim. Um, by the way, Jim, my first question during my Bowdoin College admissions process was, what did I think of the Billie Jean King Bobby Riggs tennis match? <laughs> <laughs> so Billie Jean, I'd have to put her out there too. But um, anyway, talk about a loaded question. My question to Jim was, does he, with his busy schedule, does he prioritize the important things in his life when he's out running? Is running an outlet for him? And does he do a lot of thinking when he's out on his runs? Um, so I um, rely on running as much for uh, mental health as physical health these days. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I run nearly every day um, and in the mornings. And on days that I don't run, my chief of staff around one or two o'clock in the afternoon will say, you didn't run this morning, did you? Um, and I spend the time, um, you know, my mind wanders a fair bit, um, but it's also a time, especially on longer runs, to think about um, naughty problems. Um, and I find uh, I, I am able to think through problems in a clearer way when I'm running than if I'm sitting at my desk. Um, it's also the time where, um, you know, I can think more creatively and think about things that we aren't doing that we might want to do. And a lot of times I'll come back from a long run and jot down three or four ideas. And that too will can drive my colleagues crazy because that's usually on a weekend that I'll run uh, a long distance and I'll come in on Monday morning talking about these four or five crazy ideas. Um, and then the last thing I, I do is if I have to give a speech or something, I'll often think about it while I'm running. So the um, the speech that turned into the uh, book, Wait What? Um, that was an 18 mile run one Saturday in, in Massachusetts. Um, and the book and the questions popped into my head during those 18 miles. Um, so um, yeah, it's it really is a time to um, think for me. No, it is for me as well. And I will say that with Jim's book, he inspired um, one of my colleagues who was also an Olympic gold medalist for Britain, Dave Hemry. And he read Jim's book and he was visiting us at the time. And so I picked up the book and uh, I had 
the good fortune of meeting Jim before David does. But, uh, you know, I refer to running as a two way road. We all inspire each other. And that goes for everybody on the panel and everybody listening. Yes, thanks, you too. And um, really yeah, wonderful. Um, so, uh, Linda, um, you're next. Sorry to keep you waiting there. Um, Linda, you've taught me, honestly, you are one of the most fearless persons I've ever met. You, you are so brave and unafraid of anything, um, including to speak to this somewhat intimidating coach sometimes to tell me to my face that you don't like what I'm saying um, or don't agree. Um, I deeply appreciate that and uh, you do inspire me. Thank you, Mark. This is like racing. I'm tucked in right behind Joan Samuelson and Jim Ryan. I'm going to be talking about running and yoga. Hmm. Physical activity should be a balance between aerobic, strength, and stretching. As runners, we're perhaps one of the best aerobic athletes. But if you run long enough, if you run hard enough, it's going to be interrupted by injuries. By balancing running with strength and stretching, these injuries are apt to happen less often. Yoga strengthens and stretches. It strengthens key muscles used for running, quads, hamstrings, hip flexors, as well as core muscles. Yoga postures can create flexibility. It loosens muscles, ligaments, connective tissues, ultimately helping the runner run with more freedom of movement. Yoga postures are guided by the breath. It requires single-mindedness to constantly focus on the breath. Inhalations create space, exhalations create extension. Total focus on the breath frees the mind from the constant multitude of thoughts that constantly are bombarding us. You find yourself in a tranquil bu bubble of tranquility. Mindfulness and focus are needed to keep on your race plan. So how does this translate to my running? When I toe up to the starting line of a race, I'm anxious. Muscles begin, become tense and tight. So mentally, I withdraw and I move into myself. And I recreate the intentional breathing of yoga. I feel calmness to body, to mind. Relaxed muscles are more efficient. Breathing at race pace can sound like a dog with short, sharp, shallow, ineffective breathing. It tightens the muscles. At race pace, I recreate the slow, deliberate breathing of yoga. Inhalations lift my chest. Exhalations carry me forward. I engage core muscles. They lift the thorax. I'm holding my arms. I've got better posture. My body's weight is not collapsing on my legs. Legs that support less weight move faster with less effort. I'd like to thank all of the organizations for today's Zoom and my fellow panel members, and most of all, all of you people who are listening to this. I'm humbled to be in this group. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. You know, you, along with Mark, you know, touching on that cross training, so, so important, you know, how often Physical therapists tell us, runners, you're all so tight. Yep. And so uh, having these cross-training opportunities is so important. All right. So um, Bev, um, 
you have taught me, Bev, um, your stoic, your quiet determination, and your modesty. Um, I gain a lot from that every time I'm around you. So, Bev Wispoy. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to share an experience with you that maybe some of you can relate to, and it uh, changed how I think about running. So, what I've noticed what happens to me when I'm standing there in the crowd at the starting line is I'm excited, but also my mind starts to worry about how I'll do in the race. My focus, even when I'm running, becomes these repetitive, unhelpful thoughts, as some of you have already talked about too. And believe me, they really are, they really are unhelpful. Um, I've tested this. So you see, and Mark, you can cover, cover your ears now for a minute, but my secret strategy is to run cautiously and carefully, maybe with some skepticism about the pace that my training notebook says I'm supposed to be able to run. So I play it safe. But there was a day when I did it differently and when I didn't play it safe. I was running the Charlottesville 10 miler as part of a 14 mile training run for the Boston Marathon. And on a wild hair, I decided I, would, I wanted to see how fast I could go for as long as possible staying steady, staying right on that edge between um, ease and uncomfortableness. And to do this, I decided to give myself full permission to bail. I was gonna step out of the race whenever I needed to. So, but, but somehow by giving myself that permission, it left an opportunity and an opening. And I wasn't doing what I usually do, which is looking at my watch, then tightening up, depending on the numbers that I see, I wasn't constantly checking, how am I doing? Am I on pace? Oh no, too slow. Oh no, too fast. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> and instead, I had the ability of running right at the edge. Um, so after the first, uh, first mile, I found my pace without my watch and I did not refer to my watch again. So I, I knew I could run 10 miles. So I was just gonna go until I couldn't go anymore and then head off the course and finish in a neighborhood. So there was no need to really force a pace or constantly monitor how things were going. I just ran and the pace was there. And it didn't matter to me what it was. Um, my mind was out of the way. Um, the funny thing is I didn't bail. Um, and the experience was despite a tough pace, freeing, so freeing for me. I wasn't desperate to quit until near the end. And that's when I saw I was within about a quarter mile of the finish line. So I thought I could manage a quarter more, barely, <laughs> barely, but I did. And um, my trophy at the end was I threw up first time ever only. <laughs> I was really happy with the effort, um, you know, got a PR. And um, permission to bail is what it took for me to shift my focus from the goals, you know, the time, the pace, to more of an intrinsic motivation, which was caring about running the best I could do on that day, in that race, um, challenge myself um, to do what I can, rather than what my mind thinks is safe. So from this experience, um, I learned to trust the preparation under Mark's coaching, the training runs, trust those where I practiced over and over finding and settling into that zone. But as for my intention on race day, um, and this doesn't negate any smart goals that um, I might have, but, but on race day, what if I held the goals more lightly? Um, what if I focused or risk making it about the quality of the run and how much I'm in it, right on that edge between ease and effort? Um, and I made that the important thing. So I think that I learned that instead of running safe for me, um, it was okay and I could dare to risk more. So thank you. It's wonderful, Bev. You, you probably don't remember, Bev, but we ran together one year at the 4th of July 5K. I can't remember if you planned it or whether I came up alongside you when you had all these doubts. And I kept saying, you can go fast. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. And we got close and close to the end. And I couldn't keep up. You left me, you blew me away that day. And off you went. I remember you going up that last long hill thinking, oh my gosh. And afterwards you said, if you hadn't told me to do that, I don't think I could have. And I kept thinking, you're not even breathing heavy. You can do this, you know? So yeah, that was wonderful, Bev. 
And so we'll end with uh, Dr. Wilder, our co-host um, in the UVA Runners Clinic, my, my lifelong friend. So Bob, if you can say a few words, please, about your lessons learned. Bob, you're on mute. Okay, so a couple housekeeping elements first. First, I just wanna thank Mark for putting this together, uh, uh, spearheading this, and, and also for all of your coaching over all the years. As, as Mark mentioned, uh, I first approached him when I was a much younger runner as a medical student, uh, and it was a little unusual situation for me. I had been coached by coaches who had coached teams through the years. So high school, college, club teams, post-collegiate. But that was the first time I had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a coach. And uh, through the years, Mark is, you know, we, I, I had some time off, but when I moved back, he picked me up as a coach again when I was in my late 30s and into 40s and 50s. And just, I, I think all of us who, who have worked with Mark know how much he has interest in us individually. And it's, I just want you to know you're appreciated for that, Mark. Uh, the other is a little bit of truth in advertising. Uh, I sent my picture into Mark and he shot a note back saying, hey, nice old picture, he said. So, yeah, I have to admit that is a little bit old picture. It's, uh, it's, from, it, it's, it's from over a year ago. So, so I admit that. So my, uh, my lesson learned is the importance of keeping our easy runs easy and this is this is a mistake that i see in folks who get injured in the office all the time all of our training runs should have a very particular purpose we're trying to stimulate a particular energy system and when we're doing our easy runs whether it's our long easy run on the weekend or whether it's some of the shorter easier runs during the week we want to be stimulating our aerobic energy system and that is the most important engine that we bring into our marathon day and if we cheat ourselves on those days by not allowing ourselves to run within that aerobic range, we aren't developing that very important energy system that's gonna carry us through those 26 miles. So uh, critical from that training standpoint to make sure we're staying within that range. Now, what does easy mean? Easy has three components to it. Easy means easy, it should feel easy, but that's not the only requirement. It should be in that aerobic heart rate range that we should have defined by our training. So one may be able to run faster than that and it still feels easy, but we gotta notch it back and keep it within that range. That conversational pace is a nice way to, to gauge it. We may be at the very slow end of our aerobic heart rate range we may be at the higher end depending on how we're feeling but we got to stay within that range it's got to feel easy if we're feeling good we don't want to go beyond that level because now we're not developing that energy system the other reason is for recovery purposes when we train we break down tissue and in doing so we stimulate it to build up and that's a good thing that recovery period, that building up period, that stimulating of the tissues continues on beyond that training stimulus. So we've got to take the necessary time to recover from our harder runs. And if we don't do that, what happens? We A, start to break down and get injured, and B, we're not ready to be prepared for those next harder runs that we should be ready for. So let's make sure that we keep those, uh, keep those easy so that we can be best trained, as well as uh, making sure that we have uh, uh, adequate recovery. Uh, I learned uh, a lesson with my very first marathon. I was a senior in college. We had finished the cross country season and a few of us had decided to join some of our alumni buddies who were running the St. Louis Marathon. And we only had a month after the cross country season to prepare we're in pretty good shape. We just come off of summer base training and then a, a nice fall cross country season. But we had four weeks and we were gonna build up our long run. Our longest run had been 15 miles, which we did every Sunday. And that's fine when you're running five or six miles cross country, but not quite for the marathon. So the plan was to bump to 18 and then get a couple 20s in and, and then we were gonna go run our marathon. And instead of keeping those easy, we got talked into 
those last two 20 mile runs running 30 seconds slower than race pace and then 15 seconds slower than race pace. And they should feel easy relatively and they were, but we were running much faster than we should have been to develop that aerobic engine. And what happened on race day, I think I had a very similar experience as Jim did. Got through 21 miles right at six minute pace and then the wheels came off. And I remember at 23 miles looking at my watch and it was just about the time my parents were waking up in California. And I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if they know that their son is in the most absolute worst pain he has ever experienced. And I don't think I would have experienced that if I had just been smart and stuck to the plan. So, so force yourself to keep those easy runs easy, be ready to do the harder training and then be ready on race day to run hard. Those are the days you wanna run hard. And as, as our famous runner Forrest Gump said, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, thanks. And thanks to all the panelists and thanks to all you folks that signed up to listen today. I know it's a little unorthodox to not be participating live, but like I said, we have the summer training program. And if you have any questions that need to be answered soon in this next week or the next few weeks, uh, please email them to that email address of Leah's and she'll get them to me and I'll try to answer as many as possible. Um, and if they're for the panelists, I'll pass them on to them. Um, but uh, anyway, um, thanks again. And and thanks to the panelists. Any panelists have any last words? Um, well, you're all staying on mute. Okay. Um, Joan, Joni, uh, thanks so much for uh, taking time out of your day. It's been an honor um, to have you with us, really, truly. And uh, My pleasure and honor. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, everyone. I think that's it. Leah, thanks for setting everything up and uh, um, much appreciated. And uh, um, everyone have a have a wonderful rest of uh, your weekend. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.